Well, I'm continuing this series uh, from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We saw the sign that says we have guest speakers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, I know we can chuckle about it, but actually that's what I want to happen is that we're hearing the voice. The voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through the writers and the scripture. What I hold in my hands is the very word of God. It's been translated into English so we can understand it easier. But um, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and we're at verse 21. Luke 2 verse 21. And I want to talk today uh, about the question, what about you? What about you? So Luke 2 verse 21. When you find that place, would you stand with me for reading the, the Word of God, if you're able to do so. And uh, join me for prayer. Father, it is you who inspired this Word. It is you who planned before the laying of the foundation of this earth to send your Son, Jesus Christ, to be born in the flesh. Fully God, but also fully man in the flesh. And we thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself to come to be born so that we would have a Savior who is fit to uh, give his life, your life, Jesus, so that we might be saved from our sin. So, Lord God, please speak to us now and open our ears to hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, in Luke 2, verse 21, and the scripture says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You may be seated. I'm going to need your help because I don't have a remote control up here, so I need you to go there. My question today is, what about you? And I'm going to start there, and then we're going to be talking about that throughout the message. You see, Simeon was waiting. And what was he waiting for? He was waiting for God. He was waiting for God to, to deliver the answer, the promise that God had given to him, that before he died, he would see the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who was the consolation uh, for the children of Israel. And so he was waiting. And here's my question. What are you waiting for? Oh, I know some people in this, in this modern society, they're waiting to win the lotto. 
If I could just win the lotto, then all my problems would be solved. There's just one problem that I have about winning the lotto. I never buy a ticket. So if I were to win the lotto, it would have to be where God just dropped a, dropped a lotto ticket on me. Now that's not going to happen. Some of us are waiting for the check in the mail. We're waiting for the check in the mail. If the check in the mail would just get here, then I'll be fine. Some of us are waiting for results of tests. Anybody here waiting for results of lab tests? Yeah, I know. There's a lot of you waiting. They go in to get the test, then you wait and you wait and you wait to find out what did the test say. By the time the test gets here, it's irrelevant because you've changed now. And so we're waiting. So my question is, what are you waiting for? Simeon was waiting for God to fulfill a promise that he had made to Simeon. And that promise was that God was going to send his son, the Messiah. And Simeon had received the promise through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And you're going, wait a minute, this is before Pentecost. How could it be that the Holy Spirit of God will fulfill a promise before Pentecost? Well, it's because the Holy Spirit has always been involved in the affairs of man. And in the very creation itself, remember when the in the beginning, God, He created the heavens and the earth? And remember what it says in Genesis 1, 1, and the Spirit hovered over the waters. So we know the Holy Spirit has always been involved. God the Father is always involved and the Son's involved because everything that is created is created by Him, through Him, and is held together by Him. That's Jesus. But He hadn't been born yet. How can you do that? Well, Jesus is God and He has existed before anything that it, now we see that exists, anything that was created. He's the one that, through whom everything was created and He holds it all together. So it's a little puzzling to us to say, I'm waiting for Jesus, I'm waiting for Jesus to come. We are for Him to come again. Simeon was waiting for Him to come the first time in the, and to be born in the flesh. I need you to advance, and it says when eight days were completed. Now, here's the way it was. Do you guys need help? Or you got it? Okay. All right, thank you. She wasn't feeling well, so they're going to take her out. I'm glad. We need to stop and pray right now. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We want to pray for Mickey, Lorenzo, and Wayne as they're going out, and others, Duke, that are going out to help her. I want to pray for your divine wisdom to guide them. I pray if she needs help, that the help would get here in a timely way and that she would be cared for. And thank you for listening. Thank you for sending help for Mickey and Lorenzo. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what we're doing. When you see a need, we just need to stop right there and take care of it. Go to God. Take it to God. Anyway, when a boy was eight years old, eight days old, well, not years, eight days old, he had to be circumcised. And uh, he was, when he was circumcised uh, under the covenant with Abraham, that was a sign of God's grace because God had made a promise to Abraham that would be fulfilled and it was an unconditional promise to Abraham because he was justified by faith in God. Now there's another covenant that you may be thinking, but... And the other one is the covenant to Moses, which was the law. The covenant to Moses is dependent upon obedience. It's conditional through obedience to the law. But the, con the covenant made to Abraham was an unconditional promise. That speaks to me about grace, something we don't deserve that God provides for us, which is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? So it says when the days of her purification, so that at eight days he would be uh, circumcised, and he was named Yeshua. We say Jesus in English, but his name is Yeshua. Yeshua means uh, it's a contraction of the name of God and the, the verb for to save. He's our Savior, and so we say God is my salvation. That's what Yeshua literally means. It's, he's my Savior, we say. He is, literally, God is my salvation. And he was waiting, Simeon was, waiting for Yeshua to come. And the next slide says, And they brought him to Jerusalem to present him. 
when the days of purification, that would have been on the 40th day after childbirth, there was a ceremony in which she was declared to be clean because it had been 40 days since childbirth and now she was, there's a ceremony and they recognize that it's 40 days and they declared her to be clean now so she could go to the temple. So she goes to the temple and uh, there at the temple, her purpose, Mary's purpose and Joseph's purpose was to take Jesus, 40 days old now, and to dedicate him to God. And uh, the title of this point that I have was, We Belong to God. Jesus, of course, belongs to God. He is God. And he was rededicated back to God for God's service. In fact, Jesus already had humbled himself and come to serve us, meet our needs, as he served the Lord God his Father. <laughs> Jesus is our all in all. He's so wonderful. But when you stop and think about what is our purpose, our purpose is we belong to God too. He's only one creator. He's the one that designed you and knows you perfectly and he, and he is the one that formed you while you were wonderfully made inside your mother's womb. Is there anyone that was born here not, not through the womb of your mother? Sometimes we have self-made people here, you know, in the church, you know. So everybody was formed inside the womb, and God is our creator. He designed you. I was uh, speaking at, uh, at Paul's service for Friday afternoon. Our, he's the, he was the father of our grandchildren, <laughs> Paul Lambert, and he was a civil engineer. And uh, I was speaking to a bunch of engineers in the crowd, and I, had, I got to thinking that God is our master engineer, in a sense, because he designed us. And he's the, also the maintenance department. He not only designed us and created us, but he maintains us in order. If you look ever at the, the way a person's uh, created and it's inside the cell of a human being, it's like the most amazing mechanical engineering design ever because it's got worm gears and conveyors and, and chemical plant going on inside one cell just going on, and it's all designed that way. Anyway, so they're there at the temple, and they're rededicating the Lord Jesus Christ back, and the next cell is a uh, map, and I wanted to talk real quickly a couple things. Just where are we? Well, this is a map of Israel. You see the Dead Sea at the bottom, and there's a blue ribbon that goes up, and that's the Jordan River, and up there's the Sea of Galilee up at the top. Nazareth is just to the west of the south tip of the Sea of Galilee. It's one way you can find it really quick. And you go over to the left and you see Nazareth. And there was a road that went down the, the valley. Of, it goes down through a valley, of course. Down through the valley of Jezreel, across the Jordan River, down on the east side of the Jordan River, and then back across by Jericho, which is just north of the Dead Sea, and then over to Jerusalem and then down to Bethlehem. And so they had traveled this, this way uh, from Bethlehem the south end, which is only five miles going north. Look at the next slide. This is a view from Bethlehem, which is kind of on a hill, looking through kind of a, 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 a small valley there toward the Temple Mount where uh, Jerusalem is. And so you're looking from Bethlehem down through this kind of a valley, and you look back up to the next higher elevation, and that's, that's a... Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and you can see the uh, the dome of the rock up there, and the Temple Mount is straight back in the center of this picture. But that's what it looks like the terrain. So you're imagining that you've got Mary and Joseph and the baby, and they're traveling from this hill down through this kind of a valley back up a very steep, and it's very rocky. Everything is rocky over there, and they're going up. Let's look at the next slide. That's what Bethlehem looks like. I said it was a hill. You can see there's Bethlehem sitting on the top. And the shepherd's fields are all this where there's a little bit of grass and a lot more rock, I think, around this. And that all goes down. So if I were to look back that way, I'd see Jerusalem. Okay? So that gives you an idea of the kind of terrain where the shepherds were. And that's the terrain where Joseph, Mary, and the baby had to travel from the city of Bethlehem back down and then back up again to go to the temple on the Temple Mount. This one, you kind of get a picture of that. Let's go to the next slide. Acts 3.25 says, uh, by the way, you know we can be accepted by faith too. Abraham was accepted by faith. Do you know how God expects us to come to him? 
by faith. You have to trust in Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it means you don't trust God, you don't believe God. If you don't trust God and you don't believe God, you're not likely to obey Him because you think your way is better than the way of God. So that's why faith is required. You've got to have faith and trust or belief to be able to rest upon what God says and say. If God said it, I trust that, I believe it. I may not understand it, but I trust and believe it that God knows what He's doing. So if He's told me to do something, I need to do that. If he said don't do something, I need to not do that because God's will for me is good. He's trying to protect me from myself. Can I say he's trying to protect you from yourself? Same way. It's like we're trying, he's trying to protect us and guide us so we'll go the right way in our life. Anyway, Acts 3.25 says, You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He didn't say might be or under condition. He just said shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, Yeshua, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities, your sins. So why Jesus come? He came to save us. But one of the things he came to save us from was our own self will. The power, he breaks the power of sin over us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to break the power of sin over our life and set us free. When he saved us, he saved us from the penalty of our sin, but he also saved us from our own self-will. He saved us and broke the power of sin and set us free. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to jump up and down and say, praise God Almighty, God cared enough about me, a sinner, to be willing to send his son to take the penalty for my sin so that I could be free. The chains of slavery to sin were broken at the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're just talking about him as a little baby today. But he never really was just a poor little baby, was he? He always was God. He always is God and always will be. Anyway, Paul took this controversy regarding circumcision. Remember it when he was being criticized about the issue of circumcision and Paul went back to the council at Jerusalem and he insisted before the council that it wasn't right to impose upon Gentiles. I think that's most of us. We got at least one son of Abraham by birth in here and uh, born again too, praise God. But most of us were Gentiles and we are set free from having to obey the law in order to become adopted into the family of God. We've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to become a son of Abraham by faith. So when we sing that song, it's kind of a camp song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You could say, and I am one of them. Amen? By faith. So although circumcision was given and it was a sign of grace, it became to the Jews a seal of works because they kept thinking about Moses not going back to Abraham, which was he was justified by faith alone. So in order to fulfill that covenant of Abraham, Jesus had to be circumcised. Why? Jesus came and he satisfied both the law of, that God gave us through Moses he also satisfied the grace of God by faith. So Jesus satisfied both the law and he satisfied grace. He didn't do away with either one. He came to fulfill both. Both grace, what a gracious gift, the Son of God, Jesus. And he fulfilled all of the law perfectly. Jesus never committed sin, never did any sin, and he never will do any sin. He is perfect and he's holy, holy, holy wonderful Savior we have. Anyway, then he was named. You know, when he was, when he was circumcised, then they named him. That was the custom. And the name they gave to him, Yeshua, was the name the angel told them to name him. Because what the angel was saying is, there's meaning in a name. Do you know what the meaning is of your name? You know, when we named our kids, um, we named them with the purpose, especially Jonathan and Joseph, Jonathan is uh, God's gracious gift. 
And uh, he was a, hard, a gracious gift. And Joseph, in Hebrew it would be Yosef, is increasing. It means like more faith. And so that's we're still praying for Joseph that he might have more faith. And uh, but there, you know, he God entrusts these children to us, and it's our job to try to raise them and pray for them and help them. Next slide. So my question was at the beginning, what are you waiting for? It says, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just. He was a righteous man. He was devout. He was dedicated to God. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, here we go again. We hadn't had the Pentecost, but here we have an old man at the temple serving God, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit had given him this promise. Verse 26, the next slide says, and it was, had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit's upon him, and the Holy Spirit speaking to him. And I believe Simeon was an Old Testament saint raised under the law of Moses, but he had faith in God and his faith justified him before God. He also was, I think, a very careful man. I don't think Simeon was a careless man saying, well, I'm forgiven, now I can do whatever I want. No, no, no. I think Simeon looked at it as, I'm, I am God's by faith. And if I am justified by God, I will live by faith. And if you have faith in God, your desires are one, please Him. I mean, if somebody gives his life for you, don't you think we owe him back our life? We can't ever repay God for what He's done for us. There's no way. I could never repay God for what He's done for me. But the rest of my life, God deserves me to dedicate my life to Him to serve Him. And He is, God's wonderful. He... He allows us a lot of uh, freedom to do things and make choices and be creative like He is creative. And he, He's entrusted us with wonderful opportunities to experience life. But all the time we should be thinking, is what I'm doing or saying, does that honor God or not? Does this please Him? If it honors Him and it pleases Him, then I think the Lord says, go play. Go enjoy life. Go enjoy fellowship with one another. Go enjoy serving one another. Do all these things you, you, you can do. But always remember that what we do should be under the guidance of is what I'm doing pleasing to God. And so Simeon was a man who lived like that. He was a man who was just and he was devout man. And he was waiting. Waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. What's devout mean? Devout means reverent. I think that's a really good word. Reverent means to, boy, it's to revere, to respect. In a sense, it's to have an awesome fear of God, but not to be afraid to approach Him. It's more of a honoring Him because He's holy, holy, holy God, and He's so wonderful. He's created us. He wants to know us and have a relationship with us. But He's holy. And we shouldn't be doing things or saying things and thinking things that are wrong to defend Him. So, how can we do that? I don't think I can do that in my flesh. I'm, I'm just like you in many ways. I'm, I live in the flesh. So, how in the world can I possibly live a life that honors Him? By His help. The Holy Spirit helps me. And He reminds me. Does God ever get a hold of you and... Kind of grab you by the ear and say, hey, do it. That's a, yeah, I know. And, uh, he gets me by both ears, only one ear for you, and he goes, Rick, I'm talking to you, listen to me. So God gets a, and that's a good thing though, because that's a reminder that you're his. Anyway, Simeon desired to live this kind of a righteous life, and you know why he had a high view of God. You want to know how to live a devout life? Have a high view of God. And a humble view of yourself. Have a high view of Almighty, beautiful God and a sense of realizing who in the world you are dependent upon Him. But you can trust Him. I depend on Him, but I can really depend upon Him because He's so perfectly trustworthy. He's amazing. So, trust Him. Jewish religious leaders, what's amazing to me is they were totally unaware. I don't think even the people living in Bethlehem understood that the Messiah was coming to be born in their village. I don't think he would have been given a place 
or Mary would have been given a place to deliver, to deliver the Christ child in the stable if they had known this is the Messiah. You'd have had an entourage coming out of Jerusalem and all the other cities coming and making a big hoopla and nobody even knew it until the angels showed up and told the shepherds, which were just down the hill, tending the sheep at night. If you have hope in Jesus Christ, we should be careful to live a righteous life that pleases Him. And the sad thing is the religious leaders were not. They should have been setting the example for all the people. They had become mostly political in their character, their nature. And they were not deeply spiritual. In fact, there had not been a prophet over Israel for 400 years. Nobody was proclaiming the truth, the Word of God, with power of the Holy Spirit anymore. No prophet for 400 years. And they had also, during this period, been oppressed by one foreign power after another, after another, after another. And it, they just didn't get it. They just became more legalistic and more ritualistic, and they just weren't depending upon God himself, and they weren't looking for him to return. Even though the Old Testament scriptures told them, when King Herod asked the, the scribes and the, these uh, religious leaders, uh, where was he to be born? They knew. They knew the scriptures. The scribes were in the business of copying over letter by letter the scriptures, so they knew what the scriptures said, and even though they knew what they said and they knew that he'd be born in Bethlehem, nobody was posted in Bethlehem looking for him to be born. Nobody. So who are you waiting for? Are you looking for Jesus to come back? This same Jesus whom they saw ascend into heaven, that same one is coming back. He's coming back, the same one. I mean, really. In power. The next time, he won't come as a little baby. He will come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Are you waiting for him? We should probably move from heaven and go over to the uh, Mount of Olives and kind of gather around and make a place for him to land because when he lands on the mount, it's going to split. And two... Huge earthquake. When he comes back riding on a white horse, you won't have any question. Who is that? Who is that guy? Why does it say King of Kings on his thigh? Why? Who is that? <laughs> you ever get discouraged? I have a word for you. Look up. You ever lose hope? I know a person who is my hope. I want to share him with you. His name is Jesus. He is our hope. Now, he's not a hope like somebody says, well, I, I hope so. He's our hope like I know so. I don't know how and where and when exactly, except the Mount Olives, but I'm not sure which side, <laughs> which tree. I don't know that. And I don't know what day. And I don't know what hour, but he is for sure coming back. This gives me hope. Because no matter what's going on in the world, are there troubles going on in the world? In the night, I heard the helicopter going over my house like it does from time to time. And it was going, it was making the turn right over my house. And I was I was looking at the searchlight and looking at the skids <laughs> as they were coming around and making another pass going around. And I'm, I'm always interested in that light that's gyroscopically controlled so it stays focused on the perp, <laughs> whoever they're whoever they're after. So he's focused on him, but he was going around and around, and I thought, there's trouble about two streets over. We're on Johnson Street. There was trouble again. And I was thinking, there's trouble in Hammett. There's trouble in Orange County. There's trouble all over the United States and around the world. In Egypt, where Jesus was taken by his parents after he was born, remember after all this? They were, they were warned and they went down to Egypt and stayed down there for a while. There's a lot of trouble down there in Egypt too, right now. Lots of trouble. So I think we all need more hope. 
especially the more trouble there is, you need to have a hope. And my hope is in Jesus Christ, not in this world. I get frustrated. Am I the only one? You get frustrated too? I think I need to go in a quiet place and just think about Jesus. <laughs> That's how I get my peace. It, it, it really takes all this anxiety away. Be more expectant. Do you expect God to answer your prayer? He will. Do you expect Him to return soon? He's got to be coming back any minute. People have been waiting for over 1,900 years for Him to come back. And some white people might be saying, well, if He had to come back by now, He ain't coming back. And I want to say, don't count on that. Don't count on the fact that it's been a long time because I think His time to come back is getting really, really close. We not, may not make it to next Sunday before he comes back. Are you all ready? Amen. If you're not, you need to do business with God today. Third, let's go to the next point. Jesus came to save all who put their trust in him. Verse 28 says, He, Simeon, took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He saw Yeshua, he saw the Savior, Jesus, he was holding him. Verse th the next one, verse 31 says, Which you prepared before the face of all peoples, a light, Jesus is the light of the world, to bring revelation to the Gentiles, hey, thank you, and the glory to your, of your people Israel. So Simeon was full of hope, and he was waiting, and he was getting old, but he's, he's got to be thinking, it's got to be coming soon because I'm getting really old. I mean, like I can't even hardly do this anymore. You see how the terrain was? Mountainous? You had to be fairly sturdy to get your staff and go out for a little hike down the hill and then back up the Mount Zion, you know. Unless you live up there at that elevation, it's a tough climb. But he had his hope in the promises of God and he believed God that he would fulfill his promise. An Old Testament saint upon whom rested the Holy Spirit and to whom the Holy Spirit communicated. He had to be a really wonderful person to know. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is very important. I hope you listen to this, what I'm going to say. Joy and peace and hope are the opposite of some of our most common problems. Depression and anxiety and despair. The opposite of depression is joy. That's not happiness. It's not based on circumstance. It's deep abiding joy. The kind of the opposite, the counter, the remedy for anxiety is peace. Man, I wouldn't trade the peace of God for anything in the world. And despair, he's my hope. I have hope. No matter how troubled things are, and they are, I'm realistic about that. I know that I have joy and I have peace. And I have hope to replace my depression and anxiety and my despair. I've always said the gospel is the greatest prescription for healing ever. Next, next slide. Simeon, he said that the Lord is allowing you to depart in peace. And I'm thinking it doesn't say his age. It speaks of Anna in the next passage. passage that she was an older woman, but... It doesn't say how old he was, but I have to think that when he said he'd seen him and he was ready to depart, he was probably not a kid. When he met he was ready to depart, he said, it's like, I can die now. I've seen the Savior. Why? Why was he ready? Because he knew God was in the process of fulfilling his promise that he had been promised. He's seen the Savior. He holds the baby. He knows this man who's, who's got the Holy Spirit upon him and to whom the Holy Spirit speaks. This old Jewish man serving in the temple, he knew when he held the baby, the Savior had come. He knew this was not just a child. It wasn't a baby. It was the Savior. He knew this. How did he know? The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. 
That's why he was so relieved. Can you imagine the picture of this older man who for years had been around religious leaders who didn't believe in the Messiah coming, weren't looking for him coming? He was. And that sweet, dear lady, Anna, they were there serving God, fasting, praying, worshiping God, and waiting and waiting and waiting around godless supposed to be leaders who weren't even looking. I wish I could say today that every pastor of every church was God-fearing. I wish I could say today that every pastor today bases every message that they ever deliver from the Word of God and they've received it by grace through prayer and the Holy Spirit's talking to them. I wish I could say that, but we have some today saying that things that are abominations are okay. Cannot be. Cannot be. Good word. i got to give you a happy word. Joyful word. Psalm 37, 4. It's not in my notes, but it's delight yourself in the Lord and He'll grant you the desires of your heart. Keep your eye focused on Him. If your, if your delight and your desire is the things of God, look to Him. Look to that and don't get so discouraged by all this stuff going on around us. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, His desires will become your desires and you will find yourself discovering this joy and this peace and this strength that you can have through the hope of God. Those who hope in Christ, you will be rewarded if you're looking for His coming. You'll be rewarded for that. I told you about, our, uh, about Paul, our son-in-law. He, he had met with me and I had just felt like I need to go talk to Paul. So I went over and I went up over to talk to him and it was just me and him. And I was talking with him about eternity. He brought it up. Week before he went in the hospital, we didn't know how soon his death was coming. And he talked with me about how whether he lived or whether he died, he had faith in God. That if he were to die, he wasn't worried or afraid because he knew he had peace. He put his faith in Jesus Christ. How do you think I could stand there with my grandchildren, our grandchildren, and get through that memorial service unless I had known that I heard from his lips an assurance of his faith in Christ? What about you? I keep asking that. What about you? Are you prepared? Do you have faith? Are you ready? Have you, in your heart, I know we haven't physically seen Jesus, in your own heart, have you spiritually seen Him and come to know Him? The next point. People who accept Jesus Christ are going to rise. <laughs> and others will fall. Thank you. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary's mother in the next slide, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many. I got a, two ways. If you humble yourself before God, He'll lift you up. When I came to come, come to Christ for salvation, my first move was to get on my knees. I fell before God. And I gave Him my life. When I stood up, I knew I was forgiven and saved. But for those who refuse to humble themselves before God and fall before Him, He will, it will bring about, you're bringing about your own fall by rejecting Him. He's not pushing you down, you're pushing yourself down by refusing to humble yourself and come and say, Oh God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe in you. Receive